right. Anyway, the Chief Justice, <laughs> anyway, the Chief Justice was coming through the courthouse one Sunday, and I had my granddaughter down there, and uh, I introduced him, introduced her to him, and I said, Elise, this is the Chief, Chief Justice, and she goes, uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> Anyway, I had a pleading, and you know about divorces, and people just need to get a life. And it had been four years since this woman had been divorced, and she was representing herself, and I, she had several appeals. And so she was told on a, an order to demonstrate why her case shouldn't be dismissed because she wasn't complying with the rules. She filed her answer. And it, it, it was about 25 pages long. This is just one of them, but part of it was, I must not be forgotten the span of four years. The movement has psychologically abused and legally badgered me by the filing of merit, meritless civil lawsuits. I have attached a picture of my husband with his girlfriend. <laughs> and then she goes, and I am working on a federal suit against the crooked ass Judge Stephen Michael George, J Special Judge Bailey Taylor, the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court, Randy Ream, and I'm going to go to federal court and take care of these absolutely corrupt judges from top to bottom. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's something that you have to uh, put up with. All right, I'm going to give you a brief history through my eyes of our court system. We started I started practicing law in 1972. Wendell Ford hired me, and I went out here to the local Department of Transportation. I was a trial attorney. My chief attorney was Charlie Huddleston, and Charlie was D. Huddleston's brother, who hadn't been elected, who was running for Congress at that time, or yeah, for the Senate. And uh, his <coughs> other brother was Paul Huddleston, and Charlie had one eye, and he was colorblind, and he also had quivers. And so we walk out the very first day, and Charlie says, well, you drive. And I said, well, I don't like driving other people's cars. You drive. So he gets in the car. We go about two blocks. He can't tell the stoplights. He can't tell whether they're red or green. He can't tell how far they are because he, only, he has no depth perception. And his foot's going up and down on the gas. And I said, oh, OK, I'll drive. <laughs> and Charlie sent me up to Edmondson County. Uh, we went up there and we met a guy named Hambo Houchins. Charlie said, well, he's about the only Democrat in Edmondson County. They hate us up here because Wendell beat uh, Louie Nunn. And uh, he said, now you're coming up to trial tomorrow. And I said, Charlie, I haven't been admitted to the bar yet. I just passed my bar exam yesterday. And he said, that's all right. The judge can swear you in up here. And we went up there and I went up bench and the judge swore me in as a lawyer in Edmondson County. So I went up the next day for a trial, and I went to the library the night before, and I was going to do the voir dire, and that's where you question the jury at the beginning. And I studied and studied. There wasn't much law, uh, law books on how to do voir dire. So I get up there, and so voir dire is over, and I go up to the judge, and I said, it was Cap Martin, and Cap's doing this all the time. Cap goes, well, where's Charlie? And I go, well, I don't know. And he says, well, then you're doing the trial. And I said, Judge, I've never been in a courtroom before. I just know Perry Mason. And he said, go ahead. And I said, well, what do I do next? And he said, make your opening statement. So every time I'd go up to the judge and say, what do I do next? <laughs> call your first witness. <laughs> make your closing argument. And uh, it was a condemnation trial. And condemnation trials are pretty easy because you don't have somebody going to the penitentiary. A farmer or somebody makes money off the state. It's not that bad a case for the plaintiffs, for the prosecuting lawyer. You, it, it's a range of evidence between two expert witnesses. That they have to come up with a dollar amount. I came back and I said, Charlie, where were you? He said, I wanted you to have your first trial. And Charlie didn't like trials anymore. And it, the office was way backed up. And I had, I had a lot of trials. The next, I had maybe 40, 50 trials the next four months, five months. And then Charlie said, well, now you're going up to Elizabethtown. They haven't had an attorney in three years. And you're going to try trials up there. So I tried 89 trials in a year. 
I mean, I was trying trials every day, and, and all of them were giving money to people. <laughs> and there was one county, Lyon County, Kentucky. Lyon County had had Kentucky Lake, Barkley Lake, uh, I-24, and 90% of the county was gone. It had been taken. And they were pretty savvy about condemnation. Not a one of them took an offer before they got to trial. And the juries always gave the maximum they could give in Lyon County. It went on forever. And I had to go over there and try trials. That was, I knew what was going to happen when I started. Then I went to Pikeville against a guy named Kelsey Friend and got my, beat, my head beat in over there. So anyway, I got a phone call from Judge John Palmore. And he said, you applied to come up to the uh, it's Court of Appeals, and now it's the Supreme Court. He said, you applied to come up here and be a, a clerk last year, and we were full, but we'll get you in this year if you want to come up. And I said, whew, good, because <laughs> I'd been working in the executive branch, and back then, Democrats and Republicans were vicious like they are today. And <laughs> it's just not as crooked anymore. It was crooked. I was so jaundiced. I went in feeling so good to the go to work and then all of a sudden I found out money changed hands to get people on the board of realtors and it was just horrible. The amount of corruption I saw in state government. Uh, I went up and did a lot of board of claims cases in Frankfurt. I had board of claims cases where there was a Republican from Monroe County and we should have paid him $25,000. His truck was driven by his, his faithful employee. He was pulling a trailer. There was a backhoe on the back of the tailor. They went down to the ferry boat at Turkey Bend Neck Ferry on the Cumberland River. And the two new ferry operators were Democrats that had been appointed to, rep to replace the Republicans. They had no licenses. They had never driven a ferry before. Now, when you drive a ferry, you're supposed to keep the engine on and push the ferry up against the shore to keep it from breaking loose. Well, they just came up, tied a couple of ropes on, and this guy comes down and he gets the truck on the ferry, it breaks loose, it goes out into 18 feet of water, flips up and the truck and the backhoe and the trailer go in the water. And I thought, well, we ought to pay you. I offered him the money and he had a Republican lawyer and said, we're not taking a penny less than this. And so we go up to Frankfurt and he gets zero. And I said, how do you do that? And they said, well, the Democrats appointed all the judges. <laughs> I mean, it was just horrible. Well, anyway, I was so refreshed to get up to the Court of Appeals because it was honesty. They were debating cases, and they weren't talking about politics, and they weren't talking about money. And every Tuesday morning, they would meet, and they would argue about cases, and they would send them back, and they might argue about them for six months. And back then, they were in Frankfurt nine months a year and went home for three months a year. We have said that back then they had seven judicial districts and they were roughly in conformity with the uh, congressional districts. We had seven congressmen. And uh, so along came the American Judicur Society from Chicago and they proposed a new judicial amendment. And that judicial amendment was debated in that courtroom in that meeting room where we met every Tuesday. Uh, they argued about what to do about this judicial amendment. And the judicial amendment would change and radically change our court system. We are far advanced over the other states in this country. Uh, this judicial amendment changed our three tiers. Before we had, we had courts that, that were run by insurance agents. I had trials in front of an insurance agent up in Shelbyville didn't know anything uh, in district court. The courts were then divided into four courts, and now we have district courts, circuit courts, court of appeals, and Supreme Court, which chiefs saw. And by going to four courts, we mimic the federal system. But we also have seven districts, and that was the seven judicial districts that existed back then. And each of those districts uh, had, each of those districts had, uh, have to have a judge from that district to be on the Supreme Court. They have to have two judges from that district to be on the Court of Appeals. Just as Judge Grice and Judge 
uh, Holderfield and Judge Wilson have to be elected within the, phys the uh, boundaries of Warren County. I have to be elected within the boundaries of 14 counties, which is the second judicial district. What happened that, that changed all that was the congressman got cut from seven to six in 1980. Now we had six congressional districts and seven judicial districts, and nobody wanted to give up their job, so it stayed that way. The uh, back to when I was in Edmondson County trying that trial, the I lost it. He got the maximum. And I went home. So went back, and Charlie said, "Well, that's all right. Those Republicans hate us, and we always lose every trial in that county." <laughs> well, Wendell Ford, who had been governor, uh, re appointed himself, as I remember, to, to Congress, to Senate. And at that time, Julian Carroll became governor, and he became governor halfway through his term, and his only job was to run for election again and make sure he got elected in 1976. So he built the, most, the strongest campaign organization that I've ever seen. And I happened to go up to Frankfurt at that time to work for the Court of Appeals. And in, he had a warehouse outside of Frankfurt. And I dated a girl some that was working in that organization. So I went out in that warehouse and it was an amazing campaign organization. You should have seen it. It was prepped up and ready to go. Uh, Julian Carroll, when he became governor, did one of the best things that's ever happened to our state. He outlawed bondsmen. And before he became the governor, we had bondsmen. And they still have them in all the, just virtually every state. And when I go to judicial conferences with judges, they're still debating whether to have bondsmen or not. We haven't had bondsmen since 1975. Johnson Bonding was the main bonding company in the state, and they hated Jerry and Carroll, and he hated them. And he got rid of, he got it, pushed it through the Democratic legislature and outlawed bondsmen. We didn't know what to do without bondsmen, so we, uh, the only place we had to follow was the New York City Pretrial Services. And the pretrial services in New York City proved that if a person had a job, if a person had a home and a telephone, they were 99% likely to come back to court. So why were we making them pay $4,000 or $2,000 or $5,000 to come back to court when they were gonna come anyway? And we changed the law and had the state set the bonds based upon the person's reliability based on statistics. And that, con that has continued to evolve and it's getting even more fair. Because the theory is, as in the judicial system, we know what's going to happen to almost every case. They're, they're so repetitive. They're so, so much same thing, same thing. So uh, now we look at a guy, and he's a first offender. He's charged with knowingly receiving stolen property. And he has, we know that at the end of his case, the work, if he's guilty, he's going to be probated because he's not a violent criminal that's a threat to society. If he's going to be probated and be out of jail after he finishes with the legal system, why should he go to jail when he's poor and can't pay a bond to wait for trial? So now we try to let people out. Also, we had a chief justice, and there's been, I think, four chief justices. And Judge Stevens was on the Court of Appeals. He had come over while I was there. He was from Lexington, and he became a very good chief judge, and he started putting cameras into courtrooms. Before, we had court reporters, court stenographers. What time is it? I didn't bring my... <coughs> Six minutes. Huh? Six minutes. You tell me. All right. Anyway, we had uh, court reporters, and court reporters were appointed by the judge, and you would go to court, and if you had a trial, the court reporter would be there. If you went in for motions and hearings and things like that, there wouldn't be any record of it. And now, every time you go into court, there's a camera that turns on. It's voice activated. There's five cameras. They're always going. There's a record of everything. And before, we would have a trial, and the court reporter would take a year to type up a record and give you the record to send on appeal. And during that year, a person might be in jail. 
A person might be losing their house and you had no record and that's what was slowing it down. And when the court reporter prepared the record, you had to give him $1,500, $2,000. And so it got expensive. He put cameras in the courtrooms. Now when we have a trial, before the trial's over, the court reporter can make me a copy of what's been said all day long and it costs $15 or $25. I don't know what it costs today. It used to cost $15. So it's, that saved our people, our litigants. It saved us millions, hundreds of millions of dollars since we did this. When I go to judicial conferences, they still don't have this. They don't have cameras. They have court reporters. Anyway, I'm going to shut up now. I had to fill in since uh, Ms. Coleman came in for Andy. <laughs> I see you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.